Hello, I'm Matt Bird, the founder and chief executive of Cinnamon Network International. I want to say a huge thank you to the Association of Christian Media in South Africa for inviting me to speak at your annual conference. The first conference, I understand, that's virtual online. It's so good to be with you. I visited South Africa for the first time just three years ago and I've fallen in love with your country. I've probably been over, a, well, I've been over a dozen times uh, to, to South Africa since. And so it's a real privilege uh, to be a guest speaker at your conference this year. I pray that you are having a fantastic time and that this conference is, has a huge uh, benefit and blessing uh, for you. I've been asked to speak about the cinnamon story and I must say as I begin telling the cinnamon story it actually comes out of my story so as long as you're happy I'd love to begin by telling my story which leads in to the cinnamon story. Uh, about 30 years ago, I met a bunch of young people who loved Jesus. They were the weirdest, oddest bunch of people I'd ever met, frankly. But there was something very real and tangible about their faith. And I decided I was going to give it a go. And do you know what? I've been giving a Jesus a go ever since. Each day, I try and follow him in my human, faltering way. I'm definitely an imperfect Christian but my desire is to, to follow his life, follow his teachings, and follow his love. And you know what? About a decade into my great adventure of following Jesus, I really felt challenged by God uh, that my faith was self-centered, self-focused, self-indulgent. And so in that, I felt God challenge me to do something. I felt him challenge me to deprivatize my faith, to take that which was so personal and profound and powerful in my life and put it out there in community and put it out there in society. I didn't know quite where to start. You know it's God speaking because you know it, it hits you between the eyes and you're, you're a little bit stunned about what to do next. Well, that's how I felt. So one of the things I decided to do, now you can laugh at me, uh, it's fine, I don't mind, uh, but I decided I would join a political party and try and outwork what it meant to follow Jesus in the public uh, sphere, in the public realm. And so I considered the main political parties and I made the decision about which I'd join. And do you know what? It's a bit like joining the gym in the new year. I don't know if you've ever joined the gym in a new year, but you join with all good intention. You look at the different clubs, uh, you, you, you decide which one you're going to join, you pay your subscription, you get your little membership card, and it goes in your wallet, your purse, and then nothing. Um, and that's what it was like for me joining a political party. You know, I got my membership card, put it in my wallet, and I did nothing with it for months. And then one weekend I decided, okay, if this means anything, I've got to turn up, I've got to show up. So I joined my local political group in Wimbledon, London, where I live and where I'm recording uh, this message from today. Um, the world knows Wimbledon because of uh, the tennis uh, championship here each year. And uh, I, I turned up at my local political group in Wimbledon and I walked into the room and I didn't know a soul. There was no one there that I'd ever met before. So I sat down, we began introducing ourselves to each other and uh, I just joined in. They were folding pamphlets and putting them in envelopes ready for a leaflet drop. So I sat down and just joined in. After 15 minutes, they said to me, Matt, could we have a quiet word? And they took me into a side room. I wondered if I'd been folding the bits of paper wrong or putting them in the envelopes in the wrong direction. Anyway, I, uh, I sat down with them and they said, Matt, uh, in a few months' time, we've got a, a local government election coming up and we've got a challenge. In, in the very centre of Wimbledon, uh, we can't find a candidate uh, from our party uh, because this, this particular seat in this particular neighbourhood is an unwinnable seat for our party. So none of the ambitious party members uh, that, are, that, are, that are here want to stand in a seat they're guaranteed to lose. So they said, what we're looking for is a loser, sorry, a, a volunteer, a candidate. 
They said, would you be our volunteer? They said, because if the ballot paper goes out to the community and we don't have a candidate, it reflects really badly on our party. So you live in the area, could we put your name on the ballot paper as a paper candidate? Um, and I said, well, yeah, sure, I can do that. So I agreed. Um, and I was traveling a lot of the time, but whenever I was home, I would uh, go out, knock on doors, engage in community discussions and debates and meetings. Uh, and, and when it got to election day, I, had, I was actually out with a friend and we would had a game of sport and we were having a drink of refreshment afterwards. And I said to Chris, I said, hey, uh, I've stood in a local election today. And I told him the whole story of what had happened. And I said, do you fancy going down to the town hall when we finished our drink uh, to see how badly I lost? He said, yeah, that'd be great. So, so thanks, Chris. <laughs> so off we went to the town hall. And uh, we got there kind of half nine. It got to half 10, half 11, half midnight, half one. Finally, at 2 a.m. in the morning, the chief exec of the local government stood on the podium and he announced the winning candidates in each of the neighbourhoods uh, across the local government area. And he got to the, the, the neighbourhood in the very heart of Wimbledon, where I'd been the, the paper candidate, and he announced the winner. And he said, the winner is Matt Bird. I was stunned. This was not the plan. <laughs> I, was, I was absolutely uh, shocked. Um, but I tell you what, I was not as shocked as the leader of my party. Um, my leader of my party was a bit surprised because they'd just elected into local government a party representative who was a complete stranger. They'd only met me once. And so I began uh, my journey of what it meant to deprivatise my faith in the political world, in the community. And, and do you know what? I've been on that journey ever since and I've realized it wasn't just God calling me to deprivatize my faith but now I realize actually that God is calling his church globally to deprivatize their faith to take that which is so dear to them and outwork it in public life, in culture, in society, in community. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand so it illuminates and brings light to the whole room. In the same way, let your light so shine before men and women that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. As I reflected on the words of Jesus, it struck me again and again and again. Our faith is not private. Our faith is not meant to be under a bowl. Our faith is like a city on a hill that you can't miss seeing. Our faith is like a, a light on a stand that illuminates and brings light to the whole room. And in the same way, the way we live our lives, our good living, living out the good news in practical, tangible ways will cause people to wonder at our faith and wonder at our God. Isn't that incredible? What an incredible calling that, that Jesus gives us as his church around the world. It's really quite mind-blowing. And... As I've thought further about this, I've realised that a, that a privatised faith that praises God, that prays to God, that preaches, it may sound like Christianity, it may look like Christianity, it may smell like Christianity, whatever Christianity smells like, uh, but it's not Christianity if that's where it ends. And the Bible says that faith without action is dead. You can do all the praying and praising and preaching you like, and I love all that. But actually, if our faith doesn't also demonstrate itself in practical action, the Bible tells us our faith is dead. And, and, and this explains why 
that in different countries around the world, the majority of people can believe in Christ and go to church on a Sunday, but it has minimal impact on culture, minimal impact on society. Because why? It's a privatised faith. Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul, said to Timothy, in the last days, there will be a form of religion that denies the true power of God. This is it. A privatised faith. A faith that's only concerned with me and Jesus and going to heaven. It's a privatised faith. But God is calling each of us and calling his church to de privatize our faith to see how our faith is outworked in the world around us to engage with and transform communities now this reminds me of one of the many amazing stories of Jesus in the New Testament and I'd like to read if I may um, from Luke chapter 17 11 to 19 now you can just sit back and uh, listen to me read or you can look it up now or later um, but I'd love just to read the story of the impact that Jesus had on this whole community now on his way to Jerusalem Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee as he was going into the village ten men who had leprosy met him they stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Go, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. It's an incredible story of community transformation, of a deprivatized faith, of a faith that impacts lives, not just individual lives, but a whole community of lepers. You know, so often our emphasis is on the forgiveness of sins. But a, the gospel of the kingdom of God, a deprivatized faith, not only forgives sins, but it has three other impacts as well. And this is what we have been exploring in Cinnamon Network. What is our th biblical theology of community engagement and community transformation? And I'd love to unpack this uh, together and then tell you some stories um, of churches doing this stuff practically, if that would be okay. So when Jesus met these lepers, he didn't say to them, believe A, B and C, and you'll be saved and I'll see you in heaven when you die, goodbye. No. Jesus transformed their lives there and then. And so these lepers have been declared unclean by the priests and they've been forced to leave their families and leave their community and live in a ghetto outside the village that's why when Jesus approached the village the first people he met were the lepers because they were living in the ghetto on the outside and these lepers weren't allowed to approach people so so they stood at a distance and cried out Jesus master have pity on us they were segregated they were separated and the powerful encounter with Christ led, firstly, to their social inclusion. These men, <clears throat> this community of lepers who had been set, set outside the community, uh, the main community, were sent to the priest, sent to the priest who declared them unclean and separated from their families and the village. And as they went, they were cleansed. <clears throat> And, and in that moment, they could be re-included with their families, reconciled with their families and their community. 
And you know, only one leper came back to thank Jesus. I think I know why. <laughs> My hunch is this. Um, I, you know, I go on trips and sometimes there are a few days, sometimes there are a couple of weeks and I long to get home and see my family. I love it, you know, I open the door and my son, little son, comes running down the, the hallway and launches himself into the air and grabs me. Um, and then uh, my daughter comes, daddy, daddy, and puts her arms around me. It's just some, and then my cool teenage son, he comes up and just gives me a little, hey, dad, glad you're home, kind of shoulder knock. And then my wife, comes running down the hallway and just like my youngest son launches herself into the air, throws her arms around me, well, in my dreams. Um, <laughs> but she's pleased to see me and we hug. And, and that night, you know, sitting at home, having dinner together, sat on the sofa, is just the most precious of things. And I've only been away a few days, um, maybe a couple of weeks. But these lepers, they've probably been separated from their families for months, maybe even years. So in that moment where the priest declared them clean, I think I know where the other nine lepers went. They ran home. They opened the door and their families shrieked and screamed with delight to see the husband, the father, home once again. And this is the incredible power of the church and of the gospel, socially including people, taking people who society has pushed to the margins, who society has segregated, who society has separated from, and actually bringing people together of every colour, of every tribe, of every language, of every tongue. This is the power of the gospel of the kingdom of God. So firstly, there was an act of social inclusion. Secondly, there was an act of economic empowerment. When Jesus met these lepers, they were economically empowered. I mean, these men living in this ghetto were scrambling around for scraps of food. I can pitch them each day, going to the rubbish <clears throat> that the rest of the villagers left on a pile and going through the scraps looking for bits of food. Um, I can imagine you know, the strain that their wives and their children were now under. Uh, they'd lost their main income earner, their main provider, um, ghettoed, unable to work. And they were left trying to survive themselves. There, there was hardly enough for them, let alone to provide for their, for their father, for their husband. So when these men were socially included, they were also economically empowered by Jesus because now they were not beggars. Now they could work. Now they could go to market. They could grow produce and trade. They could make goods and trade in the marketplace. They could earn a living. They could earn enough to provide for themselves and to be generous to others. And when we meet Jesus, he does not make us rich. This is not have faith and get rich quick. This is when we meet Jesus, when we encounter Christ, we grow in confidence, we grow in integrity, we grow in our ability and in interpersonal relationships, we become more motivated, we have a greater sense of destiny and purpose and calling. Um, you know, and we want to make a difference in the world and serve other people. And do you know what? <laughs> that often leads to us getting jobs and getting promotion. Uh, when I studied theology many years ago, we looked at a, 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 um, a something called redemption and lift. When somebody comes to Christ, redemption, there was social lift um, because of the, uh, the, the transformation that happened in their lives. And at the time, when we studied it, it was seen as problematic. But actually, now I understand it's the gospel at work. This is the gospel of the kingdom of God. Uh, because, you know, ch when people are poor, charity is important, government's important, family is important. But that gives dignity to no man or no woman. Actually, the only long-term solution to poverty is, is jobs and enterprise. And Jesus gives us creativity 
and entrepreneurial ideas, not just to make money, but to create jobs for people. And he calls churches to help people find work. So firstly, social inclusion. Secondly, economic empowerment. Thirdly, political justice. Jesus was challenging the political injustices of his day. Now, politics simply is the way that we choose to live together as a society. And Jesus, in, in engaging with these lepers, touching these lepers, he was challenging the politics of his day. He was challenging the social, cultural norms that separated from lepers, that didn't touch them, that segregated them and made them live in ghettos. He was challenging that. He had so many encounters with lepers where he touched them, spoke to them, engaged with them. Uh, and, and so much of what Jesus did was challenging those societal norms. You know, he challenged the fact that, that people weren't allowed to heal on a Sunday, but, but, but it was ridiculous, you know, crazy. Um, he was challenging, I mean, the fact that a woman uh, caught in adultery was dragged out of the house and was about to be stoned by a group of men. And Jesus said, stop, who hasn't sinned? I mean, the big injustice here was what, she was caught in adultery, so she was caught in adultery with somebody. What happened to him? He was allowed to slip out the back door while the woman was taken out the front door and was about to be stoned. What sort of society was this? And Jesus was challenging the norms of his society. And here, with the lepers, what kind of society diagnoses somebody with a disease and then forces them to live in a ghetto? What sort of society is that? There are so many systemic system issues. There are injustices that exist within the very fabric of our society that when they encounter Jesus, they're challenged. And this is the gospel of the kingdom of God. It's not just the forgiveness of sins. It's socially including people that have been left out. It's economically empowering people and lifting people out of poverty. And it's challenging the, the, the evils and the distortions of the system that marginalises some and elevates others. Yeah, yeah, this, this gospel is transformational. This isn't just a nice Christianity religion, something you do on Sunday. This is radical. Sometimes Christianity can feel so sanitised and safe and domesticated. But actually, Jesus and the gospel of the kingdom of God are incredibly transformational. They're incredibly radical. They go to the very root of our identity and our society and our communities. And this is the biblical theology of what Cinnamon Network is all about. Cinnamon Network can be summed up, the mission of Cinnamon Network can be summed up in just four words. We help churches transform society. That's what Jesus did. That's what we do. We help churches transform society, modelled on the life of Jesus and how anybody who encountered him experienced transformation. And I'd love just to tell you some stories um, of Cinnamon from around the world. I mean, Cinnamon Network started when I, uh, I heard a, a speech given by a British Prime Minister and I was in, in inspired that the, the church had a, had a role to play in society, that it had a place. And that's when I began the Cinema Network story. And, and that was a decade ago. <laughs> and now we're developing in nine countries around the world, including South Africa. And we're seeing some incredible things happen. Um, let, let's, let's start with a story um, in South Africa. Uh, there's a church that uh, we work with um, in, a, in Soweto and they uh, have 50 odd congregations that meet many of them in township schools and they meet on Sunday and they praise God they preach they pray amazing um, I've had the privilege of preaching preaching at one of their uh, congregations as well and 
But, but what was the impact, they began to ask, on the township school they were meeting in? And they thought, we can do all this on a Sunday, but what's the practical impact that our presence here has? So they started saying, actually, congregations, churches, campuses, as you meet in, in township schools, why don't you bless those schools? And so those churches began to uh, transform the physical environment of those schools. They clean them up, do the gardens, make, make a, a, create a better learning environment. And as they did that, do you know what happened? The teachers became more motivated. The children engaged in their learning better. And as a result, educational attainment lifted. And this project now has been replicated in more than 25 schools uh, across uh, Soweto. Isn't that incredible? Another beautiful story, COVID-19 story, where um, a church in Cape Town um, began to make PPE, protective, uh, personal protective equipment, uh, particularly face masks, protective face masks. And uh, just incredible, they mobilised volunteers to make protective face masks initially for key workers in the community, in clinics and care homes. Um, and then they made hundreds and then thousands of these masks. Now they sell them to businesses who pay them for the masks and they use the money to reinvest back in making masks for people who can't afford to buy them. And as they've worked with Cinnamon Network to tell this story, other churches in Cape Town and in South Africa have heard the story and they've begun to make protective face masks. And we're seeing Project Mask replicate in churches uh, across South Africa. Another incredible story from uh, Pretoria. Um, a church um, began a relationship with the local police station and they began to pray for them, relate to them, offer to serve them, offer chaplaincy uh, to the police team and, uh, and began to ask them, how can we help? Uh, and so they started a prayer line to pray. They provided uh, chaplaincy services to the team. They uh, refurbished the police station. And guess what? Uh, the team got more motivated, the team uh, achieved more. Crime in the community began to reduce. And now this Adopt a Police Station uh, project has been replicated by 11 other churches who have developed the same approach. And this is what the heart of Cinnamon Network is about as we help churches transform communities. We find brilliant church-led community transformation in, uh, models, projects. And then we intentionally and deliberately help them replicate across other churches. And we're finding now um, uh, church-led projects that are helping people who are unemployed uh, and helping them find pathways back into employment. Uh, we're finding projects uh, run by churches that are offering a listening ear to uh, people in the community. I mean, this COVID-19, uh, you know, there was so much isolation in our world anyway. Um, and social distancing is the last thing we needed because now there's even more social isolation and even more mental health challenges. Uh, but by the way, I don't really believe in social distancing. I believe in spatial distancing. We need space. We need physical distance. But we don't need social distance. We actually need to find ways to engage and connect with people, to include people, social inclusion more than ever before. And... Uh, uh, the, 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 the act of, of uh, reaching out and, and, and finding people. And, and this particular church has developed a community listening initiative where they offer to be a listening ear to people in the community who feel all alone in the world. And in fact, this is a project we're seeing replicated not just in South Africa, but around the world. Uh, I'd love to tell you some of the other stories of what we see happening um, in, South, uh, in Australia. Uh, another country where there's a cinnamon network. Um, in, in Australia, there, on average, one woman a week is killed, not by a stranger, but by a, a partner or former partner. Um, and the police receive a call every three minutes about a domestic violence issue. Uh, domestic violence is pandemic in Australia. And uh, we found a church that had started a program to work with offenders, um, perpetrators of domestic violence 
And you can imagine if a church says, oh, uh, if you're beating your wife or beating your husband, turn up on Wednesday night, you can imagine what sort of response you'd get. Uh, but instead, uh, the church said, look, if you feel your anger is beginning to damage your relationships, come and join us. And so they've created a way to uh, help and support people who feel their anger is beginning to damage their relationships. And uh, since we found this project and been replicated in seven churches uh, with our support now, they've actually managed to replicate in more than 25 churches across Australia. Um, in Denmark, another country that's developing Cinnamon Network, uh, we found a church that has developed a program to help people uh, find freedom from addictive and unhelpful behaviours that might be drugs or alcohol or other habits that they find unhelpful. And, uh, and this project has been replicated in seven churches across Denmark and now it's replicating in churches in the United Kingdom. One of the amazing church-led community transformation stories there is of a project called uh, Pieced Together. It was run by, is run by a church in East London and it was particularly focused on working with women who had experienced severe brokenness in their lives. And the programme uses um, crafts, art and crafts, uh, to engage women to find restoration. Uh, one of the things that the, they do on the programme, and I love this, is they take, and I want to do it actually, they take a pattern dish or plate, they smash it, and the women talk about the broken experiences that they've had in life. And, uh, and then they pick up all the pieces and they remake a plate of all the broken pieces and restore the plate into something uh, beautiful again. And they talk about, um, they, they talk about how, um, yeah, beauty can come from brokenness and how that brokenness in our lives we can be healed from and, uh, and it can find a place in our new story and in our new future. It's just profound. And that project has now been replicated in more than 25 churches in the UK. I could tell you story after story after story of church-led community transformation projects. Our vision as Cinnamon Network International is actually to help 35,000 churches globally engage in their communities in transformative ways that they were not doing before to help 3.5 million people who are experiencing vulnerability and isolation. And in the midst of this global pandemic, that global goal could not be more important and significant. So I'd actually, if I may, I'd love to ask for your help as the uh, South African uh, Association of Christian Media. I'd love for your help, ask for your help to help us tell the stories not the story of cinnamon necessarily, but the stories of local churches who are doing amazing things in their communities. I'd and I know you do this already, but I'd love for you to work with us to, to, to ensure that those stories are getting out because we want to inspire every church, not just to preach, praise and pray, but to demonstrate God's love in practical action in their communities. Never has the need for the church to deprivatise its faith been so critically important. Uh, and around the world, we are, are partnering with media organisations and, and uh, broadcasters to tell the stories of ordinary, average, normal local churches who are doing something remarkable to socially include people to economically empower people and to, do, and to require political justice in their society. And I would love to work with you. I'd love to give you my personal email address. It's matt, M-A-T-T, -T, bird, B-I-R-D, at cinnamon, as in the spice, network.com, matt, bird, at cinnamonnetwork.com. I'd love to invite you to be in contact if you think you can help in any way. If, you th if your church is doing something remarkable in the community, I'd love to hear about it. And I'd love to work together to tell the story 
that Jesus transforms lives, that churches transform lives. And the church is rising to the challenge and the needs of our world today. This is my story. This is the story of Cinnamon Network International. And I would love for you to be a part of this with us too. Thank you so much for listening. I look forward to joining you in conversation right now.